Hello, I'm Zonal here, and welcome to another video on the TechQuest. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking away in the comments on my GTA 5 video on the GTX 960 when the good old GeForce GTX 750 Ti was mentioned. As part of all the testing I do on this channel, I often have a small collection of various cards from multiple years ready to go into a test rig for whatever reason. Some of these cards are very new, are ready on 9060 XT you'll be seeing next week. There's also a couple of Intel Arc GPUs here and there, but some of them are getting on a bit now. Well, one of those old cards is the GeForce GTX 750 Ti. It's a card I have a lot of respect for, an incredible budget option for gamers at the time, and this particular card has been with me for the best part of a decade. It doesn't often see the sun now, but this conversation got me thinking, hey, what can it do today? Let's get to it. The GeForce GTX 750 Ti is a budget focused card from early 2014. It features 2 gigs of GDDR5 memory on a 128-bit bus, and at launch it reviewed very well, both in terms of its gaming performance as well as its overall excellent power efficiency. This last part is important though, because these ended up in lower power PCs and would work fine with a good 300 watt power supply with a 6-pin connector. Some models didn't even have the 6-pin featured on this card, making them a simple, worry-free upgrade for beginners. Perhaps more incredible though, is that NVIDIA continued to support the 750 Ti even after dropping support for more powerful 7 series cards such as the GTX 770. This GTX 750 Ti is running 581.80, the last drivers it supports, and one notch down from what my 4070 Super uses. But what can a 750 Ti achieve today? Let's set realistic expectations. With only 2GB of VRAM, most ultra modern stuff is out of the question. The ones that aren't out will rely on some pretty significant sacrifices to achieve decent numbers, and ultimately user satisfaction with note to these sacrifices is going to be entirely subjective. But with a storm on the horizon again, we may see a resurgence in the used graphics card market too, and this will certainly appear in options while the PC industry implodes upon itself at the mercy of the memory cartel and the AI castoffs they will crumb out to starving board makers. Ah, it's, it's happening again. I'm talking about memory once again. Let's just move on from that. The GTX 750 Ti, specifically this GTX 750 Ti, is a card I've had for around 10 years when I first used it in a build for a relative who has since naturally upgraded. As a result, this cost me absolutely nothing today, but you can currently find these on the market for around the £20 mark. Well, what does that get you then? As is the norm going forwards for GPU tests, this is being tested on the TechQuest's own moderately, capital M, priced PC I built for this purpose. It features a Ryzen 5700X, 16 gigs of DDR4 3200MHz gold, a Gen 4 NVMe drive on an Asus Tough B550 board, and it's powered by an EVGA Supernova 750G2 I bought for 30 quid a couple of months back. We're also using Windows 11 and the latest drivers, with recording being captured on a separate PC. Before we get started, if you like what you see, please do consider subscribing so you don't miss any more videos like this. It's just one button press, and it's free, so why not? Okay, here we go then. Be prepared to be both pleasantly surprised and maybe a little disappointed. Surprise is Fallout 4. At 1080p low, Fallout 4 was actually quite playable on the 750 Ti, but closer inspection will reveal that we're already hitting VRAM limitations straight off. It doesn't break the flow of the game, but thanks to the frame time, you can see where we're dipping into the DDR4 system pool. This memory is a lot slower than the GDDR5 on the 750 Ti, but it still remained playable enough that you could overlook the variations here. Overall, it was okay, and in a pinch, say, when everything is out of stock everywhere because of, I don't know, memory, you'll find this satisfactory, I think. Average was 59.5, with 1% at 29.9, and 0.1% coming at a slightly low 18.3. Spider-Man now. We've had to hit some real low settings here. 720p very low, an FSR targeting 60fps, but it runs. It actually runs really well under those settings. We don't quite hit 60fps, with an average of 56.4, but the percentile numbers remained good enough that this was really playable, even if it didn't look its best. Pleasantly surprising. And the percents were also as surprising at 34.6 and 23.8 for 1 and 0.1 percent. The GTX 750 Ti will play Spider-Man at acceptable settings with decent performance all day, and I think that's actually a superb result. Red Dead 2 is next. At 720p, with all options set to their lowest, Red Dead 2 on the GTX 750 Ti doesn't pass muster in my book. The 750 Ti did keep to about 30 FPS a lot of the time, but I think this was simply too compromised to really enjoy. Red Dead 2 is one of the best looking games ever made in my opinion, and part of its brilliance comes from its visual fidelity. But here, you simply just have to make one too many sacrifices to get this running in my opinion, but of course I appreciate that my opinion is subjective. Average was 30.3, with 1% at 25 flat, and 0.1% coming in at 23.3 FPS. It's not bad performance, 
but it's bad looking to get that performance. So let's try the original Red Dead Redemption. Needless to say, this was a much different story, given its Xbox 360 era origins. At 1080p alone and using dynamic resolution scaling, Red Dead 1 ran really well on the 750Ti, and you'll find a smooth, easily playable experience here. The Outback would see triple digits, but the frame rate held up well in Armadillo 2. Average was 102.3, with 1% being 79.1, and the 0.1% still being really good at 65.2 FPS. It's a solid performance. Resident Evil 4's chainsaw demo didn't do well. At 720p, I set all the settings here manually to the lowest I could get them, and then I used FSR set to performance, but it still didn't bring us anywhere near playable performance. Most of the time we'd see low 20s, but this did also dip even further down to the mid 10s, even when there wasn't really anything happening. The 750Ti is just not good enough here, with an average of 24.8 FPS, and the percent figures being even lower. 1% was just 16.1, with 0.1% coming in at a treacle smooth 15.2. Dying Light was decent on the 750Ti, at 1080p and using low settings, the 750Ti did deliver a good time here. In fairness, it is a bit more contemporary, as it did arrive at around the same time the 750Ti was doing the rounds, but it's still nice to see a better than Xbox One delivery in terms of performance. If 60fps is your red line, you could drop the resolution down a notch to say 900p, and you'd probably get there, but I didn't mind this at all. Mid 40s are fine in my opinion, as long as the consistency is there. Average was 44.4, with 1 and 0.1 being 37 on the dot and 35.5 FPS respectively. I'm going to move on to its more recent sibling now, and we're still seeing okay performance in Dying Light 2. We're using some really low settings here at 720p, and with FSR set to performance, but we're seeing similar numbers to the first game here again. Visually, it doesn't look all that different to how I enjoyed the game on the Steam Deck a couple of years back, so if you've played on that, then you absolutely won't mind this either. If 750Ti is your only choice right now, then hey, it's really not bad at all. Average was 41, with 1 and 0.1 being 31.6 and 29.6 FPS. Grand Theft Auto 5 Enhanced was a fail, simply refusing to launch at all, so we're testing GTA 5 Legacy today. Again, a more contemporary matching given the comparative age of both of these things. A 1080 being using a mixture of settings, mostly towards high, we got near enough to 60 FPS that a couple more tweaks here and there would see that number if that's what you want to aim for. I did notice while I was playing that water textures seemed to be a little harder on the 750Ti, and there would be dips into the mid 40s when you were near the docks in Polito Bay, but otherwise nothing really stood out as a problem for the 750Ti. Average was 55.8, 1% was 39, and 0.1% came in at 26.4. Counter-Strike 2 was a good time, with frame rates often in triple digits. At 1080p and using competitive settings with 2 times MSAA, Counter-Strike did well on the 750Ti, but realistically there aren't going to be many people playing CS2 at a more than casual level on something like this. It played well though, and I had no problems in my playtime with it. Average was 109.6 FPS, with good percentile numbers to back it up too. 1% was 79.9, and 0.1% was a still excellent 71.7 FPS. The precinct was a real pleasant surprise. At 900p low, with FSR set to performance, I enjoyed my playtime on the 750Ti. What was more surprising though, was the precinct's consistency, especially with the percentile figures. They've been a little troublesome before on other GPUs on my test PC, but the 750Ti delivered a nice looking game at a decent pace, with absolutely no performance gremlins that have been more than occasional in my own testing. Average here was 73.4 FPS, but those percents are excellent when we compare them to previous entries. 1% was 51.8, and the 0.1%, normally the issue, was no problem here at 44.4 FPS. It was great. Left 4 Dead 2 was naturally an easy time for the 750Ti, even maxed out. It's one of those evergreen games, so I like dropping it in occasionally as people still play it a lot, especially on older hardware, and it's nice to see the 750Ti still performing so well in these games. The average was 205.1 FPS, with 1 and 0.1 being 115.3 and 75.7 FPS respectively. Cyberpunk breaks our happy trend here. At the Steam Deck preset, the 750Ti really struggled with this one, and I don't think it was really playable at any point. Even when nothing was going on, the 750Ti still struggled to keep the frame rate up. It just wasn't really good enough, a fact reflected in the figures. The average seemed okay at 27.6 FPS, but that didn't really feel that great. Percentile figures were low too, 1% was 22.7, with 0.1% coming in at 19.4 FPS. Saints Row 3 Remastered now, at 720p and using the low preset, initially the 60fps frame rate looked fine, but the frame times aren't steady here at all, and you'll feel that in the gameplay, a momentary wobble that comes through to the controls, making precision driving a hilarious experience full of accidents. You can get by fine overall, sure, but I found myself a little too distracted by those deviations in the frame time, 
because you do notice them. Maybe upping the resolution and capping to 30 FPS would bring about a better, more consistent time here. And finally, Borderlands 2. I would expect this to run all day every day on the 750 Ti, and it did with absolutely no problems at 1080p maxed out. I know that testing old games may seem a little redundant, but I do enjoy testing these as they're still played quite a lot, and performance in 2015 might not be the same as performance now as games and drivers get updated over time, and sometimes change the requirements of the game. No such thing here though, and Borderlands 2 will run as well as it did back then. And that's a wrap for today. Normally, I have a plan when it comes to these videos, but the 750Ti was a spur of the moment decision that came out of a conversation here on the TechQuest. It's an old, now obsolete card that you can find for bargain prices on eBay and places like that, but at the time it was well regarded as an excellent budget option back when those were a thing. Recent years haven't been kind to the 750Ti. Its low RAM pool hampers it more than any of the other specifications of the card, but it's a card I have liked immensely since its release. And if you're still gaming on one, the 750Ti is just about hanging in there on some more modern titles, but you have to make very liberal use of the low settings at lower resolutions to now achieve that. It was a great card, and it's only in recent years that the sun has finally started setting on it. With driver support now done and dusted too, the 750Ti is about ready to take its rightful place in the Hall of Fame. It's earned it. Thank you as always for watching, and another thank you from the bottom of my heart to those of you who helped me continue making videos like this. I'm a simple guy who just likes talking about tech, and I always find it humbling that so many of you enjoy watching the stuff I do. I've got a lot of really exciting stuff coming up, and I cannot wait to share it with you in the new year. I've been Zenothir, and I look forward to catching you all in the next one. Bye bye.